Now, bringing you the very best in New Hampshire-based local music on IPMNation.com and 100.1 The Planet, this is Local Outbreak. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Local Outbreak on IPM Nation and 100.1 The Planet. Matt Connerton from IPMNation.com here with you. By the way, a lot of cool things happening at IPMNation.com. If you haven't given it a look lately, you definitely should. But welcome everybody, so nice to be here with you again this week. And we've got something special on the show. Uh, I sat down for a conversation with a gentleman named Ross Terrio. Now, Ross is uh, in some circles known more for being a uh, politician uh, from the city of Manchester, New Hampshire. But that wasn't the subject, of course, uh, for this show, because this is not a political program. Uh, I do another show called Matt Connerton Unleashed, which does not air on the planet, of course, uh, which is political, but not this show. Local Outbreak, of course, we focus on New Hampshire and New Hampshire-based music and so forth. But uh, Ross is a musician in addition to being a politician. In fact, he's a a fellow bass player like myself. Uh, He also, um, well, he's very into music and obviously he is a musician. And we had a pretty interesting discussion about music and we got into some other things as well. And the the entire discussion was uh, pretty New (laughs) Hampshire-centric. Um... For example, you learn uh, you learn something about me that that uh, uh, during our discussion, which might surprise you, if, you know, because I did grow up in New Hampshire, and yet there's something I've never done that is a very popular activity here in New Hampshire. So, anyway, I think you'll like this. It was a, a pretty interesting discussion, but uh, really heavy on the music. And I'm going to open with a track, however. And this is a song that we featured, I think, on the show a couple of months ago. The project is called Wood Floors, and the track is Killed the Radio Star. And we have a conversation about the song, about this song specifically, uh, with Ross uh, at the beginning of our discussion that I'm going to share with you today. So what we'll do is we're going to hear that track, Killed the Radio Star by Wood Floors, and then we'll go straight into the uh, first part of my conversation with Ross Terrio. So uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. But again, this is Killed the Radio Star by Wood Floors to open up this week's local outbreak.
And I am not alone in the studio. Joining us at the news desk for the first time in a long time, Ross Terrio is here. How are you, sir? Excellent. Hey, Matt, thanks for having me on. Of course, hey, of Matt, course. I have a question for you. Yes. I was listening to that music that you hit on, and it sounded like a, a, a fusion of Black Sabbath and techno. What was that? <laughs> well, really? You should be a music critic. Uh, the song that I opened with? Yeah. Uh, that's a band called, a uh, Boston band called Wood Floors. And the track is called Killed the Radio Star. Um, but uh, yeah, Techno and Black Sabbath. Mm, really? Um, did you like it? I did. Mm, yeah, yeah. It's got kind of a kind, kind of, of a cool a, groove. I like the bass line. Yeah, a little depressing tones to it, though. Yes, yes. I, I don't know. Do you know much about music? Not that I do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so there are some there are some musical tones that when the Catholic Church back in you know the Middle Ages didn't want you to play. Mm-hmm. And and that's what a lot of Black Sabbath music is that like that heavy bass line that you're yeah. not supposed to minor chords. And, yeah, yeah, they're they're they're, they're considered uh, not melodious or there, there's something about them. But those chords are con- they're very like a negative energy or depressing, and that's kind of the feel I got from Wood Floors. Is that what Wood Floors it? is the band? Yeah, that's interesting though. See, I didn't know that, and I was um I was raised Catholic. I was raised in a Catholic home. I uh, went to Catholic school, grade two to grade eight, but I did not know. It doesn't completely surprise me, but I I didn't know this. That so the the Catholic Church at at one time. I mean, this was obviously a long time ago, but they they believe that there were certain tones, certain musical tones. That, and, I'm, that, and I'm not completely sure. So I used to play bass guitar. Oh oh, we have that in common. All right. Yeah. And so my music teacher, you know, bass guitar teacher, used to. We were doing different things, and he said a lot of actually you have to you know give the Catholic Church some credit. A lot of what we know about music about. Um, the research and and the, and the different things was done by the church back in you know the middle ages dark ages whatever did you know different chords and different things but he said there are certain tones or certain chords that aren't supposed to be played together because they're and and the i don't think the church said it was sinful yeah but they just said you know this is not these certain musical uh arrangements aren't don't go together well or shouldn't really be played that's fascinating to yeah. me i mean this is i and i I have no reason to think he would be lying to me. Right, right. No, that's really interesting. I don't know if you know this, but uh, Geezer Butler, the uh, bassist for Sabbath, he um, read an, an interview. This was a long time ago. He was talking about how when Black Sabbath first started to get get popular, he was worried because um, I, I guess he, he you know he was a, a devout Catholic and really? and um, he he was. I don't know if he is today, but um, and he said that you know and he came from a very Catholic family. And he said in this interview that he he got worried that his family would think that he was, you know, doing something, you know, involving himself in evil somehow, uh, playing with Sabbath. And um, in fact, he had actually, I forget if he was actually in the seminary studying for the priesthood or had considered going into the seminary, but had he not gotten into, uh, gotten in, in a plane in a band, that mm. was that was kind of the, the path that he was on. I've always said, and I, I've I've said this to other people, and and the, the response that I often get is, oh, "I never thought of that," but you're right. I'm I'm curious if you would agree that um, uh, Black Sabbath, I think, is the most misunderstood band in history because um, you know they they've got the the vibe, you know, the dark vibe, mm. and and you know some of those some of those songs like "NIB," "Nativity in Black," and whatnot, you know, which uh, a song which specifically talks about the devil. You know, the song is about the devil falling in love, and, and wouldn't that be interesting? But um, Ozzy explained this once, and I I, I thought, you know, I, I can see where people misunderstand, is that, you know, if you really pay attention to the lyrics, it's it, it's none of it's coming from a place of, of evil. It's it's uh, certainly, it, it's a place of, um, but there is a certain hopelessness to it. And a certain hopelessness of looking at the world and being frustrated by, by frustrated by the evil in the world. Like you take a song like "War Pigs," for example, mm. which is obviously a, a fantastic anti-war anthem. But um, you know, but but people misunderstand Sabbath. You know, Ozzy said Sabbath is like the original peace and love band, but people misunderstand. Like if you see, um, if you look at early pictures of Sabbath live. You'll you'll see pictures of Ozzy. He would stand at the front of the stage and do the double peace sign, but he wasn't doing it ironically. Like he meant it. He meant mm. it, peace and love. But but uh, but they expressed it in, in you know with uh, with with minor chords and a you know a dark tone. You know. I, no, I I always took him at face value. I thought 
one, I thought it was a gimmick, mm. so somewhat to an you know, but two, I always thought that maybe maybe they were into some type of like alternative, satanic type of really. Yeah, I, I never, I didn't know that deeply. I will say this: the, there are certain bands that are really cutting edge. That think of like Nirvana, mm -hmm. think of uh, the Clash, think Black Set. Like they were the first ones, or or the first ones to, to gain notoriety in a certain genre of music yeah. or subgenre, if you can call it rock and roll. But when I think of Black Sabbath, nobody else was that at least that was mainstream was doing that type of music. You know, right. Think of Led Zeppelin. Think of you know, there are different bands that come along that, like a new era, a new a new genre of music, a new era. And I, and I think of, so although I didn't know that deeply about Black Sabbath, the story behind them, yeah. I did think they were cutting edge for their time. I, you know, I have several of their albums. And I will say, though, uh, what, the song, I think it's NIB, it, I think it, it has a slash. I think it's NIB Wall of Sleep. Is it? I, I think it's, I could be wrong, but I think it says NIB wall of sleep okay i it, it wall of sleep actually google it maybe yeah is actually an hp lovecraft what it was about was that he wrote a story about uh, um a man who's mentally ill he's a killer he, ki he kills several people and they put him in an, an asylum and at night he goes into this alternative i guess where he where your soul would be when you're dead and he's he's in a epic battle with another soul with they're they're like traveling in the universe and trying to really destroy each other. And he's, he's angry. And, and during the day when he's awake, the, the do, he talks to the doctor and he's explaining a, the, this, and I'm not probably not doing it justice, but he's, he's explaining what's happening in this alternative universe where he actually, where his soul lives. Oh, and he's not just this inbred low intelligence killer. He's actually, a person who is who's got this vendetta and he's trying to settle a score with another immortal spirit in this other place and that's what the wall of sleep was about it was written by hp oh. lovecraft who was a a very famous macabre a horror story you know author yeah and that's what the in obviously ozzy and the members of black sabbath were aware of the story because that's what the song is about okay so you know, the very literate people oh you know, definitely as, yeah. as are Led Zeppelin, when they sing about, you know, J.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit and the, the the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Yeah. Some of their songs are about that. Um, so I looked it up. Okay, so Behind the Wall of Sleep, sometimes referred to simply as Behind the Wall, is the third track from their self-titled debut album. Uh, the intro to the track is entitled Wasp, so it's oh, Wasp okay. slash Wall of, of Sleep. But it says on the North American version of the album, the song is merged with N.I.B., that's why I was confused that's, because it just runs into it. It's, that, yeah. yeah. So you, well, so you were right. Um, but, I had uh, that album. That's why the cassette. So that I kind of I remember seeing that somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And it says here, uh, this is from uh, Black Sabbath, uh, Black Sabbath fandom dot com. It says uh, the song's lyrics are based on H.P. Lovecraft's short story uh, behind the wall of sleep. Very interesting. Yeah. It, and it's mm. just a, you know, it's a short story. A, a I guess, for lack of a better word, a horror story. It's a great concept. Yeah, and it's it, I liked it even more when I when I learned what it was about. I mean, I always liked the song, but it was very interesting to me to find out w the reason for it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'm a big uh, Sabbath fan. I love Sabbath. I I actually like. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's funny though. I uh, Dirk Don is in the chat room, and we were talking about this. Oh, he's got some comments in here uh, about that. Actually, um, I I actually I actually like uh, some of the post Aussie stuff better, only because. I love all eras of Sabbath. It's just like with Kiss. I love all eras of Kiss, the original, the non-makeup version, the newer version. Mm. But um, I, I, I love the early stuff with Ozzy. But I felt like when Dio came in, I, I, I love Dio and and even uh, Tony Martin, who's kind of an unsung hero of, of Sabbath. You know, who came in later. I think he's great. I don't know if you ever did. You stick to the original Sabbath. So or? I, I like. So for me, the original Sabbath was the best version of Sabbath. But I remember I was man, probably 14 or 15-ish when Ronnie James Dio took over. Mm -hmm. I like Ronnie James Dio. That being said, I think he was, wasn't he classically trained as an opera singer? Um, I don't know. but I want to that, say, that... say Ronnie James Dio had some classical type training. He wasn't, you know, nothing against Ozzy. He's a great singer. And I, and I think he has the best version of Sabbath. 
but here's the thing. I think Dio probably technically is a better singer than Ozzy, yeah. but I can only think of two of his songs, uh, The Last in Line, Rainbow in the Dark. You know, I don't know. Like, I know a lot of the Sabbath songs from when Ozzy was the singer. Yeah. I don't know that many. And I didn't actually, for me, the original, uh, the the when they first came out was the best version. Not that I don't like it, but around 79, 80, you had uh, Crazy Train. Yeah. I, I thought that was a little bit more commercial. From Oz, I, well, that's from Ozzy's uh, solo. Oh, I'm sorry. Solo and, material, so that was yeah. a little bit more commercial, but I'd yeah. make an analogy to to um, uh, The Clash. When The Clash first came out, they were great. And then as time went on, like Rock the Casbah, they came a lot more commercial. Yeah. You know, they're making money more popularity, but I, I thought it, they kind of got away from their roots for the money. Yeah. And I, I, I guess Ozzy did that, you know, when he when he did do the solo um, Crazy oh, yeah. Train. Yeah. But I do like Ronnie James Dio. I just don't know that many of his songs. And I, the other person you said, I, I don't know him at all. What, what are some of his big big ones? Tony Martin. Well, the thing is, so when Tony Martin came in, by the way, Dirk in the chat, uh, Tony Martin is his favorite. He likes Tony Martin better than Dio and likes Dio better than Ozzy. But when Tony Martin came in, that was at a point where they didn't really have any mainstream hits at that point. You know, they, they had become more of a... I don't want to say underground, but more of a more of a sort of an indie level band, you know, and which of course led to the reunion with Ozzy when they became should I call huge them again? And this is this is inappropriate, but a cover band. Basically, he was covering early Sabbath. Would no, that be? no, no, because they were still putting out new albums. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. they just weren't, you know, they weren't platinum sellers. But. I'd make an analogy, and again, I could be wrong on this, but I like Journey back in the eighties. You have a. a the, the new guy is from the Philippines. I forget his name, but he oh, sounds yeah. a lot like Perry. Ar Arnell Pineda. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. He mimics he's, them really but well. I don't know if he's, if you know what I mean? They're, they're, they're kind of covering their early, a lot, of, a lot of what they do is they cover their early material. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. This is Local Outbreak on 100.1 The Planet and IPM Nation. Matt Connerton with you. And now here is part two of my recent conversation with Ross Terrio and um, a surprise a uh, bonus guest uh, chimes in as well. This is uh, this is pretty cool. Check it out. We have a call. Uh oh, is that Hopwood? Oh, I, I, my apologies. Sorry. Hey, how's it going? <clears throat> hey, how's it going, Matt? How are you? Oh, hey, <laughs> that was really scary. I was afraid our yeah. Black Sabbath uh, conversation had summoned a demon. Well, it sort of summoned the demon in me, and that was what I was sort of <laughs> trying to get across there. Uh, hello to you, Matt. Hello to the guest as well. Um, mm -hmm. My name is Prank Stallone, but don't be afraid because I'm actually a friend of the show. Yes, we do love Prank Stallone. Is that Rocky's brother? Um, Matt, how are you? How are things? Um, can you give me one update for the people on my channel, a positive update, something good that's happening in your life that will get people all jazzed up and will say, oh, nice, Matt, he's doing well, all right. Oh, uh, well, you know, it's a beautiful day uh, here in Manchester, and my good friend Ross Terrio is here. How's, does that count, or do you need more? Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, good. It's a beautiful day out, and you're hanging out with a good friend. I yes. uh, love that. Yes. Absolutely love that. Oh, my goodness. Um, but it, <laughs> if, if I could say all this music talk, it kind of got me thinking in all seriousness, Maddie. I know you're a musician, right? I am. And I'm sort of a musician, not like you, but I sort of am. And I was curious if you would have any interest in possibly collaborating on a song for the channel. I think that would blow the roof off. I think the young people call that a collab. Exactly, Maddie. Let's do it. Honestly, let's do it. I'm going to send you a message. Let's collaborate on a song. You can maybe play some you know, heavy-duty guitar on it. I can do vocals. We'll figure Ooh. something out. Let's do it, though. And um, did your friend play music? Yes. Unfortunately, I don't. Uh, no, well, not any. I haven't done bass in a year. I suck at it. But oh, Frank, you have got to hear his uh, Frank. Frank with a P. Oh, Frank, <laughs> you've got to hear the the Glenn R. J. Willett rap, the uh, indie rap thing that you. Oh yeah, that is that was probably number one in Manchester. That was with my uh, wow. my, my hip hop alter ego, M. Sizzle. I'll be honest with you, Maddie. I probably don't want to listen to that. I want to keep the respect <laughs> I have for you at the level it is. Um, so I probably won't go ahead and listen to that. But I'll tell you what, if you get, grab some maracas to your friend there, he can jump on the track as All well. Right. I'm telling you, it's the MC Collaboration 2022. It's coming. It's coming, my friend. Have a good day. All right, you too. Frank Stallone. Thank is, you. You know, this is. <laughs> I, I predict that this is going to be bigger than fire. Bigger than fire. Yeah. That's the young people say that too, don't they? They say bigger than fire, I think. 
F Y R E. That, that, tra- that track is bigger than Fire. Oh, you mean like Firefest? Yeah, yeah. Oh boy. Ooh, you watch? You ever watch any of those documentaries about Firefest? No, but I've read all about it. It just it was amazing to me what happened. Yeah, they, he sold. You know, he he say lack of a better word, a con artist. He he mm-hmm. sold. You know, he hyped this image of this music festival. Took all this money, and in the end, it was nothing. I, I don't think anybody showed up. There were some tents with like grilled cheese sandwiches, and <laughs> yeah. And I, didn't he go end up going to jail for like ten years? I believe he was convicted. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. he was in federal prison for quite a while. I think so. There's yeah. There's two different. It's kind of odd. There's uh, two different documentaries that came out around the same time. Like Netflix had one, and Hulu had the other one, or something. And um, I watched. Uh, I watched them both. Um, yeah, I can't remember the guy's name, but uh, I want to say it was an Irish name. It was like Brian McCarthy or Brian. Something. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't. I don't remember. But, but that but, being said, though, did both of them portray him in a bad light? Oh yeah. Thing? Oh yeah. Well, there's no way to to you know really uh, put a positive spin on that guy. Here's the thing that that get, you know is he a complete delusional narcissist? How did he think he was going to get away with it? If I mean, was he really sincere? He thought he was trying to put something together, or did he was he a con artist? I mean, all of that money, he's he's going to get in a lot of trouble once it falls apart, which is what happened. Yeah, it is a, it's an interesting question. I remember wondering that. I think a lot of people wondered that at the time because, if I remember correctly, he had been involved in other cons previous to Firefest, oh. something involving uh, like cell phone calling cards or something. And so he had done, he had uh, pulled some other, other things, but, you know, it, you do have to wonder obviously he knows he's going to get caught eventually. So what, what is the point? And I have to assume that someone like that is severely mentally ill. Or was he really sincere? Did he really think he was going to be able to put it together? It is possible that in the very beginning, he did think he could pull it off and maybe had delusions of grandeur. And then, Mm. I mean, that's another thing too, is he might've, he might've been sincere initially and then just got, I got in way over his head and uh, and maybe at maybe at a certain point he kind of gave up and said, "There's no way I'm going to be able to pull this off like I envisioned it." But it's too late to turn back now. So and then it sort of goes from being a sincere effort to becoming a con. Mm. Maybe I I don't know. Because if you look at the original Woodstock, that was a cluster, but it mm. turned out. I mean, the the organization, the logistics, it was a cluster. But the big bands did show up, and you know they made a documentary of it, and it's. People still think about it, what, 55, what, how many years later, 1969? Oh, yeah. Uh, the the cultural relevance of it is, yeah. is, uh, has endured uh, over decades. Yeah. But it, it's true. I, people who were actually there d- do say it, you know, it, it wasn't as, um, wasn't quite as grand as it's been mythologized to be. And there was, uh, you know, not, uh, really not even anywhere to go to the bathroom there <laughs> and all the problems that come with that. And then mm. it was, and then it was all kind of a mess. But, uh, you know, but it's but it it has endured as a as a, a, a cultural uh, phenomenon, and yeah, people still talk about it. Send an, e- an email to Matt at mattconnerton dot com. I got kind of stuck there. Sorry, I think uh, I, I think I uh, my brain something's wrong. I think my brain is bad. I have a bad brain. I don't think so. I know you. I know you get a little bit prone to depression, but. Well, uh, and the allergies are uh, terrible, and it affects my brain. I get uh, I get foggy brained when I've been uh, sneezing uncontrollably. The pollen is incredible this year. It's very bad. It's very I, uh, very bad. I came out to my car, and it looked like the police had dusted my car for <laughs> fingerprints. You know how you, yeah. you, the, it was covered with pollen, but I could see f- you all where all our fingerprints. Are. I was like, yeah, holy cow! It looks I've, like the like, police have been here. I don't remember ever seeing it this bad ever in my life. <laughs> I've seen so much pollen. It's, it's, uh, we, where we live, there's, uh, the kitchen table is right next to these windows, right next to the porch. And, uh, you know, Jenny's been wiping down the table every day because it's the pollen oh, coming is, is coming through the windows and landing on the kitchen table. And I don't remember that ever happening before, but every morning there's this, this coating of pollen on the kitchen table it's now, just now you have a you have a scientific background correct me if i'm wrong but no i'm isn't... actually I'm, I'm terrible at science well whatever i'm gonna ask you anyway okay <laughs> isn't pollen the reproductive cells of trees and flowers uh, uh i i just thought it was uh there to make me sneeze uncontrollably it, it's it's i mean part it, of it, like it, the, it probably has some the other purpose egg and the whatever you know to, to for that they can reproduce oh so isn't, isn't so the trees 
I, yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's part of their reproductive process. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, while we're talking, I'm just curious. I don't know. All I know is when I look out my window and it looks like it's snowing out because there's so much uh, pollen in the air, I, uh, I just, uh, I know I'm in for a, uh, a sneeze-tastic day. Are you, um, are you on an antihistamine? No, I just take an over-the-counter decongestant, uh, and um, that actually does it for me. I, I, I'll take one in the morning when I'm all stuffy, and then I'm good for the rest of the day, really. So I, uh, I Yes, so this is from Wikipedia. Pollen is a powdery substance produced by seed plants. It consists of pollen grains, highly reduced microgametophytes, which produce male gametes, sperm cells, pollen grains. So basically, this is the male tree's reproductive material oh looking for the female um stamens looking for the other part oh well now it just sounds dirty yeah now well, it now it just sounds like uh you know when we're wiping the stuff up i feel a little uh feel a little dirty about it you know like why is that all over the kitchen table if that's really what it is Damn trees. Yeah, take your antihistamine. We're gonna have to cut down some trees, I think. Yeah. To prevent all this uh all this tomfoolery with the pollen now that we know what it really is. I mean that's gross. I'm kinda grossed out. I almost wish I didn't know that. <laughs> Sorry, you can't take that back. And that's making me see that's what's getting in my sinuses, you know, the the the, the yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's now, I mean that's uh it, now you probably wish you knew less about science. I yes. Well I didn't think I could know less about science than I already did. It's do, like my worst subject. But, do you have a green thumb? Uh no. I if I did I wouldn't be here. I'd be at the hospital. Oh, you mean like uh with uh planting Plants and, and th- oh trees. No, I don't. Uh Jenny does. Jenny has uh constructed a beautiful garden on our porch. Uh, I do not. I am uh probably the least outdoorsy human you'll ever meet. I would be perfectly happy to uh you know, really I don't even want to go outside. I wish I could just teleport from one room uh to another uh you know, like just uh not even uh drive here. Uh, not that it's a long drive, but yeah, I like uh, concrete and steel. That's what I like. I don't even go into the woods. I'm deathly afraid of ticks. I've never been camping in my entire life. Wow. Oh yeah. Yeah. Nature is frightening to me. Uh, I mean, uh, there's, uh, things out there that can, uh, there's like, uh, bobcats or something or, uh, billy goats. Do, are they dangerous? I don't know. There's all mm. kinds of, there's, uh, you know, I could be attacked by wolves at any moment. True. I mean, it's, it's frightening out there. I like to be in a nice, safe city. I mean, I, you know, I granted there's some neighborhoods that aren't great, but I'd, I feel safer there than worrying about staring down a bear. I mean, my goodness. So, uh, no, I, I don't. Uh, but there are there are people who don't like to camp that go camping. They, you know, they get the fifth wheel, and mm-hmm. basically they have this gigantic luxury home on the back of their truck. Yeah, and they take it out, and they they're not really camping, but yeah, they call I, it uh, glamping. Yeah, right? I think that would be your cup of tea the problem with that is i don't know what the point is though i mean what's the point if you're going to do that why why do it why get away go from it all. get away from the uh you know the rat race get away from the hustle and bustle of manchester i like the hustle and bustle i'm all about the hustle and the bustle simultaneously not to be greedy but uh i know what hustle is but what is bustle i don't really know i assume it uh but it goes with hustling mm. that's all i can say it's like an 18th century thing Bustle? Probably. Yeah, I know what hustle is. I've never heard the word bustle used in any other context. It so. always has. To, it's like a, a like peanut butter and jelly. It has to be with hustle. See, now I'm afraid with you uh, looking it up, though, that it's going to be like the something, pollen It's going to be like male gametes. It's going to be, yeah. It's going to be something uh, uh, frightening. Oh, actually, no, it's not. Oh, good. That's a big Moving relief. Moving in an energetic or noisy manner. Oh, okay. All right. Oh. Well, oh, bustle's okay, then. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's It's... Something that you would think of as like a kid, you know, like a rambunctious kid or something. Um, Mel McMell, uh, she lives in Vermont. She says, you need to come to Vermont. I will connect you to nature. You will return to Manchester with flowers in your hair and fresh eggs. Well, the fresh eggs, I mean, that sounds good. Uh, Mm. But uh, the flowers in my hair, Mm. uh, that's, uh, what if there's, see, you know. A bee in one of them. Exactly. I don't want a bee, and then there's a bee in my bonnet. Not that I'd wear a bonnet, but that's... Uh, Are you allergic to bee bites or hornets or anything? I was stung by a bee once when I was a kid. I, I It hurt, but I didn't... Stop uh, breathing. No. Okay, you're no. fine. You can get stung. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd rather not, though. Yeah, see, that's the thing. There's things that can sting you. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong in the woods. Mm. You know, I just want to... Can we just pave the entire earth? Just have it be one big highway or something? 
I mean, wonderful. remember that that commercial? I forget which paint company they wanted to paint the entire Earth. Um, you know what I'm talking about? I don't know, but I'd like to hire them to do that. I think it would be a good idea. Um, <laughs> Dirk says in Iowa, all we do is chug maple syrup. From what I hear, uh, we thank the trees with a cleansing forest fire <laughs> each year. <laughs> it's brutal out in uh, out west with the the forest fires. My God, it gets worse every year. New Hampshire's doing well though. Yeah, we do. We do well here. This is a good New Hampshire is a good place to. You know, we really don't struggle with a lot of uh, a lot of the things. You know. Uh, we don't have severe weather, really. Uh, the winters have gotten yeah, easier. Yeah, winters kind of hard. It does. But they're not bad. Easier than they used to be. Yeah, yeah. You know, we don't have uh, we don't have tornadoes, usually. Hurricanes, by the time they get up, yeah, they get up here aren't any big deal. We don't uh, have forest fires that wreck the entire place. Drought's not usually bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a good good place to be. We're not overpopulated. That is, what, 1.2 million people, 1.3? It's not like... yeah. I think it's pretty good up here. It's yeah. the, the cold weather can get to you, but other than that, I, I, I like the hills. I'm, I'm from New England. I love hills. I love forests. I, you know, I really enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I like to look at uh, hills like on TV or in paintings. I'm not going to actually go near the hills, although I do hear they're alive with the sound of music. Well, the hills, which is nice. I mean, Manchester has hills. Oh, uh, that's true. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's uh, Manchester's. Uh, I mean, uh, well, New Hampshire in the macro sense, it's uh, it's a good place. Good, uh, good, good place. I like how the Merrimack River cut, you know, goes down the kind of the middle of the city. More, yeah, a little bit more to the west side, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is local outbreak on one hundred point one, the planet and IPM Nation. Matt Connerton here, and uh, this is part three of my recent conversation with Ross Terrio. Um, what now? What is your current? Uh, do you do you currently hold office? Unfortunately not. I was an alderman, ah. kind of like a city councilor for what other cities do. Yes. But unfortunately, I lost my last election by eight votes, and uh, now I'm running for state senate. So eight, hopefully, eight votes. Yeah, it was, it was depressing. Yeah, it's a good reminder though about every vote counts. It's better to win or lose by like a a big majority. Yes. Like like, like a you know hundreds of votes because then you're like, there's nothing I could have done. Eight votes. I could have called eight people to come out. You know what I mean? I could have yeah. done a little bit more to get them. To, it, it, when it's that close, it's just, you know, who who were, who were got, who did a better job getting the vote out. Oh, yeah. I mean, eight votes. Uh, that's, that's nothing. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, every vote, every vote really does count. Um, was there a, uh, when it's that close, do you get an automatic recount? So, so initially it was nine votes and... Um, oh, and they recounted. We, we recounted, and it was then it was eight. <laughs> so I got one. Oh I picked God, up one. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> here's the thing about city elections. Just a little bit of trivia. In talking, I've been involved in a lot of recount, eight or ten or something like that. Yeah. The people. This is what the secretary, the secretary of state, or somebody on the staff told me. I think it was the secretary of state, um, former secretary of state. He said, "People that vote in city elections are very sophisticated voters because they they they're very engaged because they care about taxes." He goes, "They know how to vote." He goes, "Where well, you're going to see a lot of errors is presidential elections. The people that vote for president, not all of them, obviously, you have the, because the people that vote in every election know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But the, there's a lot of people who will only vote in presidential elections. Oh yeah, and yeah. they're not so so they'll it'll tell you to fill in the circle with the the thing. He goes, people will." circle the person's name they'll put an x through it they'll put a check mark he goes though that's where you're going to see a lot of the errors mm -hmm. he goes in a presidential election because those there are people who only vote once every four years and they oh, don't yeah. know what they're doing he goes but he goes in a city election he goes those people are sophisticated you're not going to you're not going to pick up or lose a lot of votes because they know what they're doing they're going to vote correctly and, and that was true i i had one i picked up one vote and it was like a circle vote or or, or an X. They had X'd my name or oh. something. They X'd the box. Or they circled my name. So I got one vote. Yeah, yeah. No, it is true, though. It's funny. Um, whenever, uh, you know, I, I vote in, in every election. and uh, But, yeah, the city elections, it's like you go and there's it's it's there's no line, mm. <laughs> certainly, you know. Um, you ever, did, did you ever watch All in the Family? Oh, yeah, I love that show. I think it's the greatest sitcom in the history I, of television. I, there's, there's one, and, and this is... I love the uh, well. There's a bunch. There's a, who's the son-in-law's meathead? He's very liberal, progressive now. Yeah. And, and I and I he's on Twitter. And I want to say, oh, shut up, meathead, Rob Kyle, Reiner. Yeah, Kyle Reiner was his dad. Yeah. who was a great comedian, by the way. Yeah, yeah. The two thousand year old man. Yeah. But Rob was funny too. But 
but he's so liberal now, and I just want to say, shut up, meathead from the old, you I know. I think he always Archie. was, yeah. But I loved, and, and see if you remember this one. Um, uh, 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 baby girl, what's the blonde, his daughter's name? Uh, Gloria. Gloria, but he, he had a nickname for her, like baby girl or something oh, like that. Oh, uh, little girl. Yeah, yeah, he could, and I remember, but I remember the skit, I just, uh, one of the all-time memorable and favorites. She goes, did you know the X amount of people are sh murdered with guns every year? And he's like, would it make you feel any better if they were pushed out of windows? Mm. I played that clip on the show recently, oh. actually. I forget I forget how it came up in conversation, but I was. Um, what reminded me of All in the Family was you were talking about, you know, we're talking about uh, city elections and there's that election where uh, there's that episode where um, they go to vote. They all go to vote together. You know the one I'm talking about. And it turns out Archie can't vote because he's no longer registered because he hasn't voted so long. And earlier in the episode, he's talking about, you know, how he only votes when it when he thinks it matters. Mm. And, and, and he says, he says something about, you know, I don't vote in low, who cares about the meatball elections around mm. here, you know? And then they, so they go to, they go to vote and it turns out he can't even vote because he's not registered anymore. Well, and that, I think a lot of people it, kind of circling back to what you said about black Sabbath, Archie Bunker was actually a very progressive type person. He, he was trying to make people who are closed minded and bigoted look bad. He wasn't a closed-minded, bigoted person. He was trying to make those people look bad. And and remember the spinoff? It was at the Jeffersons, I believe, was a spinoff yeah. of you know you had a black version of Archie Bunker. You know, yeah, had his own, yeah, it, George Jefferson. That was, yeah. that was a good show too. There's there's something. I, I to me, it's the greatest show in the history of television. I think Eric said for him, it's number two. Number one would be Seinfeld. I have the same list just in reverse. Yeah. I, mean, I put all in the family number one. Seinfeld at number two. But um. One of the genius things about All in the Family that nobody ever points out is, and, and I think this was key to making the series work, over the course of the series, Archie evolves, and but it's so, it's, it's very, it's incremental, and it's very subtle, mm. but he does evolve. So what, by the time you get to the end of the series, and then it goes on and it becomes Archie Bunker's place. Yeah, the bar. Yeah, he's, you know, he's not... I mean, you know, politically, he's not drastically changed, but he's not nearly as ignorant as he is at the beginning of the series. You know, if you go back to season one of that show, I mean, he's just a he's a full on full blown bigot and he evolves. But it's but it's incremental. So you almost don't notice it. But I remember watching it in reruns when I was mm. a kid. It was on every day after school on uh, Channel five out of Boston. And so I would watch it. I, I've, I've seen every episode multiple times. So you but, probably know this then. Yeah. Um, why was Jean Stapleton, did she really die in real life or why did she leave the no. show? No. Um, I remember reading about that. I think, well, she left. So it, it, you know, all in the family ended and then it became Archie Bunker's place. Yeah, and I, I think, yeah. And, and I think, I think she was only there for the first season of that. And I think that from what I read, I think she just was kind of tired of it and wanted mm. to go. Makes sense. And it it kind of with the new show, the the center of of the the universe in the show kind of the changed bar. anyway from being the house to the bar. Yeah. So I think you know Gene Stapleton probably felt like you know I'm not even I'm not even in the center of the show anymore with mm. with the, you know the rest of the cast and you know may, maybe it's time to go. I I think I remember reading that because I'd always been curious about that too. But yeah, but but they they uh killed her off in the show. So so uh, just to get back to your uh your list of shows, Seinfeld. Mm. Now, is that all genres or specifically like sitcoms? Sitcoms. Oh, uh, okay, cuz again, I do like Archie um the All in the Family. I like the Jeffersons. I liked uh Oh yeah. Oh, JJ, uh, moving on up to the east side. Oh, um, the whole deluxe apartment in the sky. JJ was uh, uh, good times. Good times. I like yeah. good times, but uh, obviously not sitcoms. But I really love one of my all-time favorite shows was The Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. Oh, me too. Just so I got about a year, year or so ago, I got on all all of my on DVD. I got. Twilight Zone, I got the spinoff, well, kind of a spinoff, the Night Gallery. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I also got um, The Outer Limits. That I've never seen. I've always been aware of it, but you, I've never actually so seen I was it. A little, so I was born in the mid-60s, and so a lot of the stuff, although it was live, I don't remember, I don't remember it until it was reruns, because mm. I don't remember things until the 70s. I was too young in the 60s. Mm. 
But the outer limits, I always remembered, they had this funny um, light wave go on, like a like a an oscilloscope type of way, like a sine wave. Yeah. And it say, and it would do all these funny things. Don't worry, we, we're taking control of your TV. We're gonna yeah. have blah 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 blah. And it's weird because when you see things as a kid, you have a certain memory. But then when you look at them as an adult, you're like, oh wait a minute, I'm, I was completely wrong. Yep. So I love the Twilight Zone one because. You see stars that did some like, for instance, um, James Kirk from from Star Trek. Yeah, William he was Shatner. The, he he had an excellent one, Terror at Thirty Thousand Feet. Yep, the original one. Yep. Um, they had people like uh, the good luck, the good looking guy that was in um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Robert Redford. Yeah, he played. He was like twenty one. He played like a cop in a show where he's the angel of death, and he's trying to. Sneak yes. His, he's yes. trying to sneak his way into. There's an old woman who's you know like eighty. Yeah. And she, but if she if she doesn't come out of her house, they can't. Death can't get her, so she stays inside her house. Anyways, but he's like twenty. He's in his early twenties when he does it. But you yeah. see a lot of these like really famous great actors. Oh yeah. And you see like their first role in life. But the but the the writing was excellent. They they put some effort into um, special effects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was still the '60s, so they yeah. can't be great at. Contrast that with the Outer Limits. I thought Outer Limits was kind of scary and kind of really cool, and then I looked at it. Oh, the special effects were cheesy. Yeah, the writing wasn't as good. It was. I was kind of disappointed, and and you know, like the pollen thing that you found out. I was, you know, I <laughs> kind of wish I hadn't watched it again because I was like, ah, this, you know, this show wasn't as good as I remember it was. Night Gallery. I was a little bit disappointed too because although. Again, I did get to see some famous people. Yeah. There was kind of a comedic element to it where it was not pure horror. There was some, they were trying to be funny and it just wasn't as good as the night. And and I think he was disappointed too. I had read that um, Rod Serling was disappointed because, you know, the uh, Twilight Zone was his baby and he did a great yeah. job. And, and, and then, you know, he stopped for whatever reason. Then he took over Night Gallery and... And he was he wasn't in complete control, and he he was disappointed, and so yeah. he left after like two and a half seasons. Rod Serling's an interesting guy, though. Yeah, combat veteran. He he almost died. He he fought in World War II. He was in the army, fought in the Pacific against the Jet. I mean, a hardcore uh, combat veteran. You know, saw a lot of the people that in his unit died. You know, mm. massive ca like fifty percent or higher casualty rate. So he you know, uh, and there he does do some skits about war. Yeah, uh, or short vignettes, or whatever you want to call them. But just a very interesting guy, very, little guy, like five foot two, oh, but just a, a I didn't, I didn't know very that. small man. <laughs> yeah, but um, very uh, you, you know, really walked the walk as far as you know, a combat veteran, just like a year or two of hardcore combat fighting the Japanese in the Pacific, huh. and then you know, come and has a very successful TV career or TV writing career. Yeah, and and, and to me, Twilight Zone is one of the best series tv series that's ever been done absolutely i've definitely seen every episode of twilight zone i don't think i ever saw much night gallery i i remember being confused when i was a kid i i think i saw it i stumbled upon it somewhere on cable television and i remember asking my mom about it i was like what is this because it was rod serling but it mm. was in color and i was like what is this and she explained oh that's night gallery that's the other show that he it, did afterwards it's but. not as good it's it, it's okay but it's just it's not as good as is it more it, of a is it more of an alfred hitchcock type thing where it's less scary but he, definitely less scary I, yeah. i'll give an example he does an episode um uh so so it, and now he did have a couple it, let's say it was two and a half seasons let's say there were 50 episodes he has a handful that are decent yeah but for the most part they weren't he, he uh, i'll give you one there's an old house that an elderly man he has a greedy nephew wants him to die so he can get his inheritance he starts putting up these scary pictures he has a man paint all these different pictures and they're scary. It's like a, a of a coffin and, and the coffin. So, so he'll go, the man, the old man sees the picture. Now it's different. He goes, somebody has been digging in the graveyard. And then the next day, like the coffins open and then he sees like a corpse walking to his house. Yeah. And so he's and so anyways, um, he, and then he, um, the, the uncle dies and he gets the house and he, he has a very loyal servant. And uh, he um, fires the servant, and then it continues. Now the the nephew's there, and he starts seeing these pictures of his, you know, his uncle's grave is getting unburied one day, and then oh. he goes by, and the coffin's open, and then he sees his. So it's it's, it's a painting, yeah. But the, but 
every time he walks by, it's a different painting. Oh, that's a that's and a then, cool concept. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then uh, <laughs> and so then he dies. Yeah, and then the the servant gets the house, the butler. Yeah, and then the same thing starts happening all over again. But in in this case, somebody's knocking on the door, and then he has a heart attack and dies or something. So it's it's okay. It's a yeah. little bit scary, but it's not. It's not the Twilight Zone. Yeah, yeah. But some of them are kind of cheesy. Uh, they have like little little vignettes of uh, like all think of all the mo- like Frankenstein, Dracula, and all the monsters, a witch having a party at like a funeral home. Mm-hmm. Like it's kind of silly, you know. Like they're oh, you know, they're trying to be funny, and yeah. it's just ridiculous. Um, but there, there are some good ones. And, and then there's this woman. Nah, it doesn't matter. It's just not as good as the Twilight Zone. Yeah. But yeah, that didn't last long, right? Night Gallery. I want to say uh, two and a half seasons. Oh, okay. So, so it, it ended like, or one and a half seasons. It, it ended like it, midway through the season. I think Rod Serling got fed up. Yeah. And said, you know, enough is enough. Yeah, yeah. Did he? Um, did he die fairly young, Rod? Yeah, I want to say yeah. So he was a he, heavy, he, heavy wanna, smoker, yeah, right? Heavy smoker. He. I want to say he must have been born in the 1920s because he fought in World War II and he was a young man. Yeah. So he must have born, say, 1920s. I want to say he died in the late 70s. So he's probably in his mid to late 50s. And I, and I believe it was cigarette-related, like lung cancer or something, but heavy, heavy. I mean, you know, here's things that's amazing. Because he would smoke on camera, right? <laughs> Which, that's amazing. Yes, he would yeah. smoke on camera. Like, you yeah. know, that would never happen today. No. <laughs> and not like, like Archie Bunker, uh, All in the Family. That show like that couldn't be made today. Oh, with couldn't, the cigars, be, yeah. yeah. Not only that, but just just the racism. Oh, well, yeah, they, yeah. And the things they're saying <laughs> yeah. couldn't be done today. No. Um, and, and, you know, you're not, you're not going to show somebody smoking cigarettes like that. You know, the host smoking cigarettes. Right. On t- th- that type of stuff's not going to happen. This has been Local Outbreak on IPM Nation and 100.1 The Planet. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Ross Terrio. And we're going to end it uh, this week with, uh, well, the way we began. He seems to like this project, The Wood Floors from right here in New Hampshire. So we're going to close it out with one of their songs, but don't forget ipmnation.com slash local outbreak is where you can go for all things local outbreak. And uh, this track, little acoustic number called Ken by the wood floors to wrap up this week's local outbreak on IPM nation and 100.1 the planet. Might as well be dead, you might as well be gone Cause I won't see you again You might as well be dead, you might as well be gone Cause I won't see you again Hey Ken, what happened to you? Have you lost all pride? Hey Ken, what did she put you through? Time to live your life. Let her die. You used to be a friend. You used to be alright. That's just remembering. You used to be a friend. You used to be alright. That's just remembering. Can what happened to you? Time to live your life. Hey, can what did she put you through? Time to let.